Uh, howdy, folks, and thanks for coming today. I think this is the uh, third or fourth time I've been to a Liberty Forum. Uh, the first time I've spoken, and it's a delight to uh, be here today. It, it always feels like coming home. Uh, there's, I've lived in Washington, D.C. for a decade and in San Francisco for almost as long, and it's uh, just a pleasure to be here today when, uh, at a place where liberty is not just prized but demanded and, and sought for when it doesn't exist in the right form. Well, what, what you folks are doing here is uh, very important, not just uh, locally but nationally as well. Uh, now, during my time in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, as a political reporter, and on the left coast as well, I've worked in plenty of large media organizations, which is why I think uh, John and uh, the rest of the Free State Project in, uh, invited me here uh, today to talk about some of my experiences. Um, I, I worked at, in Times, uh, a Washington, D.C. bureau, back when news weeklies were uh, still a force to be reckoned with. Uh, then I worked in Wired's uh, Washington bureau as their bureau chief for four years, and that was writing about what Washington was uh, doing with technology. Uh, that's when I interviewed Ron Paul for the first time. Uh, it was for a 1999 article you can still find online on Wired.com. Uh, it was writing about a proposal uh, by the Federal Reserve, uh, by a Federal Reserve official to implant tracking devices in U.S. currency to let the government track private possession of dollar bills. Now the idea was that, um, this was actually kind of a clever idea, it was that the longer you hold currency without depositing it in a bank account, uh, the less that cash would be worth. It was an anti-hoarding tax uh, that would stamp bills current when withdrawn from an ATM or bank teller. And you'll probably like what Dr. Paul told me when I interviewed him. He said, uh, quote, the whole idea is preposterous. The notion that we're going to tax somebody uh, because they decide to be frugal and hold a couple dollars uh, is economic planning at its worst. Uh, uh, that idea didn't, didn't go anywhere, as you probably know, but plenty of other bad ideas did, especially after the September 11th uh, attacks and the rise of the so-called War on Terror. Uh, creating the Department of Homeland Security was a bipartisan effort. Uh, it was originally a Democratic idea, actually, uh, but then President Bush embraced it as, uh, as his own. Uh, that led to a tremendous rise in uh, government surveillance. Uh, that is the War on Terror uh, writ large, not just the Patriot Act. I was the first reporter to disclose the existence of the Patriot Act inside the U.S. Congress, uh, but also the FISA court and surveillance by three-letter agencies, uh, some of which we know about and some of which have still not come to light. Uh, now we're seeing the surveillance debate shift to drones, uh, some of which now may be armed. Uh, after Wired, I spent some time at CNET, which is the world's uh, most uh, popular uh, technology news and reviews website. And I also spent some time at CBS News, specifically cbsnews.com. I wrote two columns, one on uh, individual liberties called Taking Liberties, uh, another one on economics called Other People's Money. This was back in the 2008 era. And I've accompanied the president on Air Force One. I've been a card-carrying member of the National Press Club. I mention all of this to you to say that I may not be an expert on media bias, but at least I've worked in enough national media organizations uh, to be able to s tell you what I've seen in my own experience. So I wanted to talk about media bias by looking at the history of the Free State Project. Uh, the first mention ever uh, of the Free State Project in the mainstream media uh, was a very favorable syndicated column uh, written by the excellent libertarian-leaning uh, columnist Walter Williams, uh, who was a professor, is a professor of economics at George Mason University. And that was in August 2002. Uh, he thought a free state was really a brilliant idea. He loved the, loved the idea. And he wrote, has the United States Congress usurped powers that were not delegated to it by the Constitution? From the ratification statements, isn't it clear that the nation's founders assume that states and the people have a right, have a right to take back powers they granted Congress in the Constitution? Uh, now, th this was uh, a prescient piece, obviously. Uh, he suggested that New Hampshire would be the best place, the best home for these pro-liberty activists who are willing to pack up and vote with their feet. Now, the, st the second mention ever, um, at least in the uh, news databases I went through, these were subscription databases, uh, was a pretty extensive Sunday profile, uh, 1,400 words, which counts, by extensive, um, counts as extensive for, for newspapers. It was written by Roger Talbo that appeared in the Manchester Union Leader uh, a month or two later. That was in October 2002, uh, uh, two months after Walter Williams' column. And the headline was, they're coming to New Hampshire and want to take it over. Now, it's true that the article wasn't quite as incendiary as a headline, and it's true that reporters don't always write their own headlines. Uh, but a lot of newspaper readers don't read past the headline, especially in a Sunday paper. Um, how are these readers going to react to the headline? Is it, is, this is the first ex exposure, mind you, uh, to the Free State Project. I mean, who wants to have their state taken over? Uh, do you like people coming over to take, uh, take over something? I mean, is, isn't a reasonable response to be to say no, no, and hell no? 
You can imagine this headline would have been written differently. Is it New Hampshire's live free or die motto attracts new blood? Or uh, New Hampshire voted most uh, liberty loving state or most attractive small government state? I mean, you could, there, there are these other ways you could, you could do it, and you, can, and you folks out here can probably think of some of them. Now, uh, to its credit, the Union uh, Leader article didn't say all of you wanted to secede and create a new Shire Silver Circle state on the Atlantic. Uh, but so someone in Wyoming must have seen it because the wire service ran a piece. Uh, the same day out of the AP's uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming Bureau. It said that once all of you moved to Wyoming, and I quote, utilities would be privatized, uh, drug and gun laws would be repealed, and quote, the threat of secession would be used as leverage against the federal government. Now again, how are you going to react to that if this is your first exposure? This is the first day the Free State Project has received national news coverage. I mean, is it my water bill goes up because these crazy libertarians want to privatize a local municipal uh, water company or crazy people are carrying guns in the courthouses? I mean, Wyoming's about to leave the union. And you might think that these free staters were uh, nuts and maybe even a little scary. Now, that October 2002 AP story was, was the more important one, uh, even though it came out a few hours after the union leader one, because the AP had at the time about 2,000 newspaper subscribers uh, who were able to pick up and run that article verbatim. And about 5,000 radio and TV broadcasters who often read the air, uh, read the report on air uh, verbatim without attribution to saying this is fact. And that article was, in fact, picked up, including by the Boston Globe. Now, the Boston Globe followed up with its own original article a month later. It reached the opposite conclusion as the AP report. It said, and I'm quoting, make no mistake, the group neither wants to secede nor to create a new state. Now, so one article says you folks all want to secede, and the next article says you don't. So I don't know if this is bias or error, but uh, something odd is going on. Uh, the, the report, uh, this is the Boston Globe reporter, it did say I, it just wants to peacefully take over a state. Now this is the takeover language again. Who wants, uh, uh, what existing residents are going to want that to happen? Now, most professional journalists would not say those descriptions of the Free State Project were unfair. I mean, the authors of those articles, if they were here today, would probably actually defend their work. Um, uh, and it's true that just because an article uh, was written that you folks uh, might dislike doesn't mean that there's bias. Uh, but I think that many of you in the room would read those articles today and read those headlines and say they weren't quite as neutral and reasonable and fair as they could have been. So let's talk about bias. No reasonable person would doubt that media bias is real. Uh, in 2004, the public editor for the New York Times, which I've written for in the past, published a refreshingly frank column saying just this. Uh, it was talking about, uh, quote, social issues, gay rights, gun control, abortion, environmental regulation, among others. And he reached this conclusion. Uh, if you think the Times plays it down the middle on any of them, you've been reading the paper with your eyes closed. And, that, and that's true broadly. I mean, the American Society of Newspaper Editors uh, has done research that suggests that journalists are younger, better educated, and more liberal than the general public. A survey of journalists uh, found that uh, at the bigger paper, 61% of newsroom respondents are Democrats or leaning Democrat, and only 10% of Republicans are leaning Republican. And that was done before the Obama administration, but I bet that uh, split, split is more obvious and more polarized uh, uh, today. An early survey found that in 1992, 90% of the Washington journalists that were surveyed voted for Bill Clinton and 7% for George H.W. Bush. Other research has found similar patterns, uh, with about two-thirds of journalists calling themselves liberal and less than 10% conservative or conservative to moderate. Now, if you're a libertarian, um, you should note that the number of libertarians is so small that they don't even uh, show up in these measurements. Uh, the late Henry, Henry Hazlitt, a journalist himself, but a better economist than a lot of tenured economists, sum, summed it up this way. Uh, when uh, when once people have decided to deride a practice or an institution, any argument against it, no matter how illogical, is considered good enough. Uh, there's uh, Back to media bias. A professor in the Department of Communications at Virginia Tech who studied media bias concluded it's mostly about framing. Uh, when you, how do you frame the war on terror if you're a journalist? I mean, is it, uh, do you frame it as uh, a, a necessary war to protect our freedom or an unnecessary war on our civil liberties? Uh, the, the one, uh, th think of how the uh, Newtown shooting law uh, was treated. Is this, uh, was the cause, uh, was the cause of the Newtown shooting uh, laws that permit Americans to buy the so-called assault weapons, uh, or was it uh, poor mental health policies, or was it lack of armed security guards at the school? 
Uh, there's another way to think about media, media bias as well, and, uh, and that's to ask where it comes from. Is it a supply of biased journalists who want to work for news organizations, or is it a demand for biased news? And the news organization is simply a, 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 in a capitalist system responding to market pressure. And w one argument for the demand side explanation is that biased news uh, could alienate customers. Now, biased news could alienate customers who have conservative or uh, centrist or libertarian views. And if you own a news organization, why would you let it be biased if you can make more money by appealing to underserved uh, conservatives or libertarians or even progressives for that matter? I mean, there might be some national news organizations who could pull it off, but it seems like a risky approach. And that's why I think the, the better explanation lies in the supply side uh, with journalists themselves. Why are journalists uh, uh, in, inclined to take these jobs? You know, there can be a, um, a, a personal and a professional uh, cost in being an outlier among your colleagues. Uh, if you're the only conservative or libertarian, or maybe for that matter, um, uh, a hardcore progressive, uh, when you're standing around the water cooler and talking about politics. I don't hide my beliefs at work, but I also don't mind getting into shouting matches with my colleagues around election time. Uh, and I like to think that uh, I do good enough work that my bosses don't care what my politics are. But other journalists might be more shy or le less willing to uh, engage in debate or really less willing to stand out. And so if that's the case, they'll probably find uh, something else to do or somewhere else to go. So in my, in my experience, uh, in interactions with hundreds of my colleagues over time, uh, I found that political reporters are generally uh, consistently uh, left of center and editors are much the same way. Uh, the better ones uh, are definitely going to go out of their way to correct for this bias, but like any profession, you're going to have the mediocre people who cannot or will not. It's a reinforcing process. If you look at surveys of political beliefs uh, at Columbia University, which graduates the, the top tier of uh, jur uh, journalist uh, candidates uh, every year, uh, you'll find that it's a very liberal uh, crop of students. And so the next uh, group of des desirable new writers are going to be left of center as well. And so uh, what I think is the case is that a uh, a for-profit, that is profit-maximizing uh, news organization, it w actually does tolerate bias. Uh, but the reason it tolerates bias is that it can hire journalists at a lower wage. Uh, th this, is, this is my argument. I'm not sure it's correct, but I think it is. Um, let's assume reporters are also qualified to do reporter-like things. Let's assume that, they can that they're qualified to work in public relations or technical writing or marketing or ad sales or something like that. And the skills are roughly similar, and people do switch back and forth. Uh, my employer has hired former PR people. I worked for CBS, and a good friend of mine left uh, last fall to go into PR. Um, I used to work down the hall in Times Washington, D.C. Bureau with Jay Carney, who's currently the White House press secretary. Um, reporters and correspondents have an average uh, annual salary of 44000 if you, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics numbers. Uh, but uh, non-managerial public relations, technical writing, and so on, the, the, all these jobs pay about 50% more. And the gap grows wider. If you care, compare editor salaries uh, to the equivalent manager salaries uh, in public relations, and that's basically a 100% increase or a twofold uh, difference. Now, think about what this means. I mean, reporters and editors uh, could give themselves a 50% to 100% pay increase um, for maybe even less demanding work if they simply quit. Uh, so, why stay, especially when you have kids in daycare, or you want to build an addition on your house, or you want to take a nicer vacation? I have one colleague uh, who uh, uh, left us, uh, makes more money, only works four days a week. Another uh, left um, is now working for Netflix and bought himself a nice Mercedes convertible. So my hunch is this. Uh, this is where I'm, not, I'm not certain, but I, but I think I'm right, uh, is that this is where you find much of the explanation for media bias. Now, there are lots of reasons why journalists would take lower salaries, um, maybe the potential for travel or the publicity associated with bylines. Uh, but many reporters, uh, in my experience, like the uh, sort of quasi-economic feel of being divorced from a for-profit organization. They don't have to worry about the bottom line. They get to do their own thing. Uh, they're more independent, and they can advocate for their own causes. I mean, the last is most important, being ab able to advocate for their own causes. And so if you agree with their, their advocacy, that's great. Uh, but the problem is uh, that many folks in this room probably don't. And as we know, journalists are not exactly uh, li libertarian-leading or conservative-leading by and large. Now, uh, to put this in, in a broader perspective, everyone knows if you're a Harvard lawyer and you work for Friends of the Earth um, uh, or you know, Save the Partially Spotted Beagles, uh, then you're not going to make as much money as you were if you were a partner at a Boston law firm. Uh, but you might feel that the trade-off uh, for wor uh, working as an advocate for causes you believe in is worth it. I mean, my hunch is that the same thing is true with journalists. I mean, some people go into journalism uh, because they feel that the ability to be advocates for their causes, and their causes are not libertarian causes for the most part, um, is worth forfeiting the salary that, that they could make elsewhere. 
And so there are two more points worth making on how this is changing and what to do about it. And until recently, um, if you're a publisher or you own a radio or a TV station, you might tolerate these uh, uh, journalists as advocates uh, because you can pay them less and because your audience doesn't have that much choice and because competition is low uh, and because the barriers to entry are high. I mean, creating a, news, uh, a new newspaper uh, traditionally was an expensive and risky proposition. Uh, USA Today lost uh, $800 million, nearly a billion dollars in the first nine years of operation. Uh, but that model starts to crumble when barriers to, barriers to entry are lower, uh, which brings us to the internet. I mean, the internet is um, the best hope for pro-liberty uh, movements in many ways. Uh, it's Bitcoin, um, it's being able to organize something uh, like the Free State Project to begin with, uh, but it also poses a, a real threat to these uh, news organizations that are facing co competition from blogs and uh, uh, eBay and Craigslist. Uh, the New York Times said in December uh, it was going to do another round of newsroom staff cuts and it reported an 85 percent uh, drop in net earnings. Many newspapers have folded. I mean, if you wanted to be cynical, you could say that the best thing uh, that happened to the liberty movement in the last uh, decade uh, is not uh, the Free State Project, it's not the rise of libertarian think tanks, uh, but it's uh, this uh, ra a rather left-leaning guy uh, named Craig Newmark uh, who lives in San Francisco and tweets about squirrels. He created Craigslist, which has put uh, single-handedly many of these newspapers out of business. I'm not that cynical, but I've heard it said. <laughs> now, a generation ago, uh, there was no Drudge Report, Hot Air, Breitbart.com, or the progressive equivalents. And if you're a libertarian, there was no Lou Rockwell.com, uh, Cafe Hayek, uh, Instapundit, Antiwar.com. And so, I mean, there were these monthly newsletters, and you could sign up for uh, Cato's mailing list. You could go to these irregular conferences uh, by, by traveling great distances. Uh, maybe you could sign up for uh, Regulation Magazine. Uh, you could subscribe to Reason Magazine. I've written for Reason. It's a great publication. Uh, but, but traditionally, these were kind of slow. Uh, these were not fast moving, and, and, they, and they were one way, and they're just not comparable um, at all to what we can do today. I mean, we're in this middle of this weird and bizarre genera generational and societal change that we haven't figured out yet. It makes activism a lot more rewarding uh, that, and powerful, whether you're a pro-liberty activist or you're a green activist. Um, uh, and I, so I talked to Chris Lawless last night at dinner, and he suggested offering some tips for overcoming media bias. I mean, you could go the usual approach, uh, which is uh, you hire publicists or um, you hire former reporters, maybe at a better salary than they're getting as a reporter for reasons we just talked about. Um, or maybe you're going to take these reporters to nice dinners. Um, if, you, uh, if, if you're a reporter and you go, um, go to conferences in Las Vegas, you'll be offered some very, uh, very nice opportunities by, pu uh, by publicists to uh, want to ba basically buy your time and bend your ear. Or maybe you can complain to reporters' editors, or maybe you can uh, write letters to the editor. Um, I'm not saying any of these are wrong. Uh, I'm just saying don't bother. So my, my advice is to um, uh, hear, hear me out. Uh, there's, uh, it's not because journalists are, are uneducable, or maybe, um, but maybe it is. Um, uh, it's, 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 it's something a little different. Um, let, let me uh, quote what uh, TJ Rogers uh, said. Some of you might know him, uh, at least by reputation. He's the CEO and founder of uh, Cypress Semiconductor, which is a billion dollar company. Uh, and uh, he's openly libertarian. He um, has given Ayn Rand books uh, to his uh, uh, managers to read. Uh, I've interviewed him a bunch of times. It's been, it's been a pleasure to use the term political pygmies to refer to what the politicians in Sacramento were doing to companies in California. Uh, and that, that's, that by itself should tell you what he thinks. But he wrote something, um, uh, T.J. Rogers wrote something 13 years ago uh, for the Cato Institute that said uh, Silicon Valley should not normalize relations with Washington, D.C. He said, which, which was the opposite. Everyone was saying, oh, let's uh, you know, go, to, go to D.C., lobby D.C., convince D.C. that you're right, uh, work within the system. Um, but, but his response was, well, I've been there, I've done that, and it doesn't work. Uh, he, he wrote, quote, the collectivist notion that drives policymaking in Washington is the irrevocable enemy of high technology capitalism and the wealth creation process. Now, I'm not going to go as far as, as, as to say that um, a journalist are the irrevocable enemy of freedom. I, I think that would be wrong, and there, there are lots of, uh, lots of evidence to the contrary. But, but that, that notion that it may not be worth engaging when you have other alternatives is a useful one. And the alternative here is powerful. So my advice to you is to not bother normalizing relations with, with journalists. I mean, you can be sociable and pleasant, and you should really respond uh, quickly when they're on deadline. All that can't hurt. 
Uh, but uh, the, your real time uh, energy and true effort should be spent uh, reaching out to the public directly. I mean, you have this wonderful thing called the internet. Use it. Uh, launch your own news organization to compete uh, with them, with me, with us. Uh, write utilities that mine government databases to find out what's really going on and to inform or help your political action. Someone in this room is doing just that. Uh, create iOS and Android apps that, that, that help the cause. Uh, use social networking. Invent your own social network. I mean, Twitter now is the most influential news organization on this planet. Uh, it's not the New York Times. It's, it's Twitter. Um, Facebook has over 500 million daily users. CNN on a good day has 300,000 people watching during prime time at 9 p.m. There's no comparison. We're talking three uh, orders of magnitude uh, difference here. Um, and so, w which, which is more important? Uh, uh, embrace these hackers and programmers um, uh, and makers in the liberty movement. Listen to their advice and uh, build great things. Uh, if you don't need the media, you don't need to worry about media bias. Thank you. No boos, hisses, or catcalls. I'm disappointed with you all. Uh, Oh, fantastic. Uh, so I, I, let's 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 talk. I, uh, do you have any questions? I'm, I'm happy to field any. I can I can at least try to. I saw your hand first, sir. Do you have any comments about John Stewart's Daily Show YouTube posting through uh, 2012, where he showed the major media bending over backwards to pretend that John. Um, that Ron Paul didn't exist. There's, uh, I watch him uh, occasionally. I don't see every episode. I'm not, I don't remember those, but uh, to, uh, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a brilliant commentator. It's a shame that we have to rely on the show that's supposedly on Comedy Central to get a good look at the political system and uh, major media. Uh, there's, uh, in terms of Ron Paul, uh, there's, I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, the um, a lot, many major media organizations, not all, but many major media organizations, uh, uh, did marginalize him and did not give him uh, the, the type of uh, fair break that you might expect, to get, given the fact that he got uh, a, a significant portion of the vote last time around. Uh, there's, a, but I, I, I don't remember those. Um, I, I presume they're hilarious. Yeah, they were. Uh, they were dramatic in which they showed major TV anchors having the results of uh, uh, votes in different states, and they would have like the one, two, three, four, and five vote getter and Ron Paul might be third, and they would talk about one and two, and then exclaim about four and five, and <laughs> never mention that there's a number three right in front of your face there, and uh, things like that. And it has a, a lot of examples, so just, if, if anyone wants to see him, you just go to YouTube and put, yeah, I guess, Ron Paul 2012, John Daly, yeah. uh, uh, The Daily Show, John Stewart, and there's a series of them. No, thank you. It actually would be useful for even for a page to um, uh, co collate those and uh, and say, well, if it, well anyway, you can you, you get the idea. Um, uh, yes, sir, in the front. Wasn't there a time that uh, Jay Carney was not liberal? Uh, he used to be on the McLaughlin group. Yeah. I kind of thought he was not exactly liberal. <laughs> Now I go. No, this was this was a while ago. This was in the late '90s uh, when I when I worked with him. Uh, there's I always thought of him as a very fair, down the middle journalist. Um, if if he had beliefs, I, I just did not get a sense that that he was really leaning towards one side or another. Uh, unlike some other uh, folks uh, I worked with at the time. Uh, so I so may, maybe the answer to your question is yes. Um, I thought of him as a very good reporter. Um, in the yeah on the orange. Uh, it's often said that all publicity is good. Do you agree with that? Well, I was going to do a slide, so let me, um, let me pull up the numbers. Um, they weren't really impressive enough to do a slide, so I mined some, some news databases uh, uh, for mentions of the Free State Project. Uh, and th the odd thing is that um, uh, in 2001, there was zero. Uh, in 2002, it was 21. In 2003, it was 100, which is a high point ever. And then it's, it gradually slipped from 78 to 68 to 31. And then there was some, it's now it's grown a little bit bumpy. And it's, in the last few years, it's grown a little. To, it's not, now you're up to 89. Uh, there's, uh, but, but you're still at 89 uh, mentions of the Free State Project in 2012. You're still not up to the uh, 2003 number of 100. Uh, there's, I, I think that was um, uh, probably because you know, when the, uh, the project was considering where to go, there, there was a lot of coverage in different states. Now it's more localized here in New Hampshire. Uh, and so, so the question was, uh, what, 
Uh, is, is all new news coverage good? I, I don't think so. I, I don't know. Uh, it, I think it depends on the situation. Uh, it, it's, it, when you have packed journalism arising, and it exists in, in certain occasions, you can have, um, a, a, especially in criminal, criminal cases, you can all but uh, indict and, and convict and sentence a guy. Uh, but when you have uh, 20, uh, 30 journalists and correspondents all piling on, oh, well, this guy might be guilty. I mean, in, in some cases, we've, we've seen high profile ones. That isn't necessarily true. Uh, so I, I think it's very dangerous in criminal cases to say that all publicity is good publicity. In political cases, maybe, because you, you might get uh, someone uh, in who read that AP article and will try to correct for AP uh, bias, real or perceived, and say, oh, well, they probably aren't wackos. I haven't heard of them before, so let, maybe I'll, I'll check them out. So I think political causes are, are different, and, and, and maybe you're right. All publicity is, is at least, in some cases, uh, decent publicity. Uh, yes? I, well, I'm going to change a little bit what I was going to ask. Follow up because uh, so 2003 was when the state was chosen, and so that's what made the news, and that's where the media coverage came from because it became a national story of you know tech. And, and you're right that it dropped off, but the fact that we are now at 89, yep. almost back up to that same sort of height, is because I think going back to what you said of the disruptive technology of the internet. Um, you know, you look back at 2003, and you didn't have Facebook. You didn't have, you know, you, you didn't have any of the, the right. social media we consider to be so pervasive now. None of that. So when you when you say we hit, we hit a peak, that was major media reporting. I think the reason we're seeing now is because the media is forced to report on stuff because there's all these things going on, and it's sort of begrudging. Because my example, my my experience with the media is they never get the story right. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have been a participant in a single story where I said, yeah, that reporter got everything right. And that seems to be the biggest um, thing that maybe everyone has started to recognize, which is why Jon Stewart has become more popular, is that there's this acceptance that in some cases, the only way you can go ahead and report on a story is with a slant. And in the you know, case of Comedy Central, it's a slant of humor. But everybody expects Fox has got one bias and MSNBC has got another bias. And people go to the internet to find out what people really think. There's and also you, you're making. Um, I'm, I'm saying you. Not, not everyone here might be part of the Free Trade Party. But the Free Trade Party generally is making more waves now politically because you have more people in office. The um, one I, what some of my searches, the, uh, the the union leader was writing this as last month. Um, uh, this is their their lead. A Democratic state lawmaker's recent web post critical of the libertarian leaning Free State Project has gone virtually viral and as as one might expect, has drawn criticism. So it's 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 a local politicking now that's driving the numbers back up to uh, where they were in 2000, uh, 2003. Uh, uh, I'll take someone in the far back and standing up. What do you think about, um, uh, I mean, do you have thoughts on, on the use of satire? Like, it's not just John Stewart, but it's spreading now. There's, there's more people using satire and humor and so forth in their relay of, of uh, topics, you know, topics and, and things that are going on. Uh, satire is very difficult to do well, um, but when it's done well, um, uh, then it can be more devastating than anyone else. I mean, people in power uh, do not like to be mocked. I mean, they don't like to be challenged, but they really, really hate being mocked. Uh, they just uh, because they, how do they respond to it? It, it, it just it cuts through a lot of their defenses. Um, so if you can do it, uh, and, and remember, do it well, otherwise it's going to just look awful. Uh, then by all means, try. It's 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 remarkably powerful. Uh, yes. So being an internet uh, you know, writer, uh, CNET, uh, but um, so uh, was it a soap opera about these? Uh, right, right. Uh, take, uh, shut, basically trying to shut down the internet is like the uh, I, double, double A, and NPA. They're, they're, it's, they say it's for copyright reasons. Uh, they want to shut down a page or something. So Mickey Mouse was supposed to the forum. But so. This can happen in commenting too. You could have, uh, you know, a comment that you want. So, from your industry perspective, and the people you work with around that water cooler, and the uh, gigantic push that started from these uh, copy, copyright concerned people, but also the government would like to regulate the internet, not the back door. So there's plenty of some cooperation. It's already been trying to pass. And your around your water cooler, do you think? Your friends might be manipulated or be co-opted to push for kind of your own demise. You know what I mean? Uh, to shut down internet freedom of speech to a certain extent. To write articles in favor of that when it's actually 
really against your own industry. It's, it's an interesting point. Uh, there's uh, major media organizations were part of um, the pro-SOPA and PIPA push. Not all, but many. Uh, th this is, a, for, for background, uh, there was a uh, proposed law in the U.S. Congress um, uh, that was uh, up for a, a vote uh, in January of last year, uh, so just over a year ago, uh, that would have given uh, the Attorney General um, the power to declare uh, websites as pirate websites. It was primarily targeting overseas websites, but it was not limited to just overseas websites. And then the, the uh, AG could uh, seek an order that would make these websites invisible. You couldn't connect to them. Uh, the D DNS would be blocked. ISPs would be um, cordoning them off. There no ads would flow to them. Uh, they'd, be, they'd be virtually invisible. You could still get to them from over overseas. Uh, so uh, that, that's, that's what uh, SOPA and PIPA would have done. Uh, the interesting thing is that the technology press was uh, is not biased pro um, RIA or MPAA. If you look at a, a lot of the technology sites like Ars Technica and Wired, putting CNET aside, uh, uh, Betabeat, um, all, all of these uh, sites that have arisen in the last maybe decade, with the exception of Wired, uh, to cover the tech industry, that they're more bias towards the tech companies and, um, and not the RA. They're more, they're more um, if anything, they're going to spend more time talking to uh, Google and Yahoo and, the, um, and, and Twitter and Facebook than they do the R RAA and MPA. So if, if there's a bias, it's, it's more pro, pro Silicon Valley and anti uh, SOPA and PIPA. And I think that uh, came through in some of the reporting. Uh, the government backdoor, the, uh, the FBI, I was one of the first to, to write about this, um, and, and the first in some cases, uh, the FBI would like to uh, mandate that some websites, it's still unclear which ones, um, uh, in, insert backdoors to allow easy government surveillance. This is a proposal. We haven't seen the details of it yet. It's not, it's not, law, it's not introduced as a bill yet. It's not law yet. Um, so are journalists in favor of their own demise? I mean, they, they might. If you, if, you, if you believe my theory about media bias, I mean, journal, journal, journalists, by continuing to be biased, are dooming themselves to irrelevance if, if, if all of these chains um, or links in the logic chain hold together. Uh, but they, they're not doing it intentionally. Um, and, this, and I don't think they're doing it in the case of SOAP and PIPA. They might be doing it more broadly about politics, but not, not, but not uh, in, in the case of copyright-related stuff. Um, that was a long answer. I'll tr try a shorter one. Um, uh, yes, sir, in the, on the aisle. Yes, yeah, so could you address, address the idea that what the media leaves out of a story is in some ways more significant than what they actually include? include. That is that they're really limiting our choices and our options of ways to think by what they leave out of the story. And how the obvious example is in the political arena, how we have certain things that we've decided to, and we think that we have to choose them all. That, that's the framing point, uh, and it's it's not even what they leave leave out of a specific story that's uh, that that they've chosen to report on. It's the stories that they don't report on at all, uh, and well, so that right, right. right. Oh, okay. Right. I mean, it's it's. Do we not report on the libertarian candidate, um, or maybe we'll just do like one nominal report so we can point to it uh, in November and say we've covered him. Uh, there's. You know that, that, that's that's one of the the, uh, the powerful uh, that's one of the the powerful effects of framing. If you just frame the debate as to say these guys are, are wackos, a libertarian, green, uh, or a conservative party, or whatnot, uh, then it, it becomes pretty easy to say, uh, or maybe they're not wackos, they're uh, just not going to win. Then it becomes pretty easy to say, let's frame the stories in such a way that, that keep this a two-party race. Uh, and it's, it's a very powerful effect. It happens. Uh, the effects uh, are, are depend on. Uh, each individual news organization. I don't think that's a very good answer, but I'll move on. Uh, uh, yes, uh, please go ahead. So uh, I'm an opinion editor for a uh, small, uh, small micro uh, and I'd just like to you know, offer some of my perspectives, and my experience, and my business. Um, first of all, don't be your own worst enemy when it comes to reaching out to the media. Don't be, oh, they're not going to listen. Uh, there are certainly friendly media like me that are in place in certain places. Um, and most, I think most journalists want to be fair. They want to offer, um, you know, different perspectives. So, you know, don't don't just say, oh, well, they're not going to care about this story. They're not going to run my letter. Chances are they will. They're people, and they want to be perceived as fair, even if they have their own agenda. Um, second of all, you know, I'd say reach out to journalists that are in your sphere, you know, that are in your community um, on Twitter, on Facebook. And if you are concerned that they are not reporting a certain issue, reach out to them on Twitter and, and just make that point to them. And, I found that in my own experience, just you know, talking to colleagues and talking to um, other journalists, and if you mention it to them, that you know, why are you missing this, this, this perspective? It's an interesting part of the story. Um, they might make an effort to do that. So just try to relate to people as 
as normal people, you know, don't try to demonize journalists. I know a lot of people just want to hate the media. Um, and there are a lot of problems with the media. I think that there is certainly a lot of bias and that there are, are a lot more liberal journalists than there are um, journalists on the other side. Um, with that said, you know, again, you know, journalists care about fairness. Um, and so make your voice heard. Speak to them diplomatically. Send letters that bring across your perspective. And uh, you know, I just think that's a good way to handle it. Don't just mess, don't just say, which I've, I've heard too many people say, and I've been accused of, you know, not publishing something because it comes from a conservative perspective. That's ridiculous. Um, make a clear argument. Uh, you know, don't just assume if there's bias and that your your voice will be heard. And I think that it's important to, you know, just make your voice heard and use whatever channels you can to create good relationships with the journalists. Well said. And remember, journalists like controversy. So if you can generate controversy, you're uh, uh, Bonnie. I just want to also mention Rachel Maddow as someone who gave amazing coverage to the Ron Paul. Lack of coverage and the delegation that That's that's a problem with a lot of moving parts. My my hunch is that a lot of uh, uh, I mean look look like uh, a professional media organization. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm I'm not saying you have to wear ties to work. I don't know anyone who actually does this anymore outside of DC. Uh, but a, a lot of uh, libertarian websites could sp uh, could uh, spend uh, stand to uh, spend a few hundred dollars hiring a designer to, so they actually don't look like uh, LouRockwell.com, which is a really a poorly designed website. I mean, I'm not talking about the content, which can be very good, but uh, just in terms of the graphic design, it, it does not look uh, professional the way you might um, uh, say the New York Times does, uh, or e even uh, second, third tier newspapers do. Uh, there's, uh, and, and the. the uh, the broader answer, I think, is, is that this is going to be a, a long-term fight. I mean, uh, uh, alternative media is not new. It just means uh, that in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, the internet's been a very good vehicle. Uh, but uh, look, at, look at the Drudge Report. Uh, this is all, uh, another um, a poorly designed by modern standards website, much like Craigslist, the market leader in its area as well. But it gets more visitors, more, pa more page views than any of the uh, major media organizations. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable success story, even though it was just uh, some guy's uh, blog uh, back uh, in the during the Lewinsky scandal, uh, so it, 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 just, it just takes a while. I mean, a lot of a lot of people create the news organizations uh, online, and then they, they get bored and they, it folds. Uh, so it's um, so it has to be a labor of love and, and keep it going for a while. Uh, I, I don't know if that's a great answer, but that's my only only one. Um, uh, let's uh, take a yes in the front row. Yes. Um who or what um, outfit do you regard as being the, the least biased, and what do you think, what if any, impact um, the introduction of Al Jazeera English into the cable news market will have? Uh, it's a, it, my understanding is that Al Jazeera English is now not going to be available online, which is, a, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, there are two questions. The first is, what is the least biased uh, news organization, in my opinion? And the second uh, would be, uh, what what uh, does the Al Jazeera change? Uh, um, what effects will that have? Uh, the the least biased. I mean, it's 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 really difficult to say. It would it would actually be some of the DC Insider magazine um, magazines or publications like Communications Daily that just regurgitate facts and don't even use adjectives. Um, it'd be a bill introduced does spectrum allocation. Okay, well, yeah, that's probably accurate. Uh, or maybe not National Journal, um, which is which is a pretty good DC Insiderish publication that is not written for the broader public. And so you have uh, people who go there that might like might be policy wonks as opposed to um, you know their, their political wonks. It would, be, it would be something like that. Uh, to answer the Al Jazeera uh, English question, I, I like Al Jazeera English. I've been on it in the last week uh, uh, talking about um, uh, some sec security vulnerabilities. I think it was the China um, and Apple hacking. Uh, there's, uh, 
they, they, the Al Jazeera English uh, does very good journalism. I, I think it's uh, up, up there with uh, many of, um, with, with say, the BBC. It's hired a lot of former BBC reporters. Uh, it's, uh, it's too early to say how, uh, how that is going to play out. I don't even know how many, uh, how broadly it's going to uh, be picked up uh, in, the, in the U.S. I don't know how many uh, cable um, operators are going to carry it. Uh, but it, that, uh, that has the potential to change uh, some of uh, the way uh, foreign policy is being portrayed. I don't, I don't, I don't see its uh, coverage of, say, the U.S. presidential election being that different ex except for foreign policy. Gun control and so on, I think, would probably be treated the same way. Uh, yes, in the vest. Yeah, I, um, I guess when I hear people talk about the liberal bias in media, I see right past that. Because from my perspective as a liberty-loving and a peace-loving individual, I see the, the problems that we face in society as a problem where some group of people think that it's legitimate for them to use force against peaceful people in order, in order to force them to live a way that they want and not the way that the peaceful person wants to, to live. So I see the bias very often as not the liberal and the conservative bias, but as a state bias or a government bias where the major news organizations actually regard the government as legitimate and regard their use of force as legitimate against peaceful people, which I, of course, oppose in all its different aspects. So from my perspective, the technology websites, as you spoke of, are sometimes the most refreshing news organizations because they actually are, have the most to lose from the government's interactions into their, into their business. Um, but the, the liberal and the conservative bias doesn't matter to me because it's all the same game of using this violent organization against peaceful people in order to force them to live a certain way. And it oftentimes, and is why I'm here and many other people are here, feels like I'm the lone wolf in the woods, you know, having that perspective where, oh, it's the liberal bias, it's the conservative bias, whatever, you know, Fox News, CNN is the same thing. Because they're all touting the government's mantra and they're just reporting, oh, the government did this as if it's legitimate and off, and it's of course none of it is legitimate. And is, is that, is that, that, that to me is the true libertarian, I'm not, I don't declare myself libertarian, but that's the true liberty perspective is, it's, it's an idea of peace. And, and it's not about this government. It's just a group of people that are willing to use force against you to, to live a certain way. Does that ever come up? Is that is that understood by by the media? I don't, I don't know. Not really. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's. I I, I I like the way you th you frame the topic. Uh, there's. I've often thought, um, I, I would have included some surveys about a status bias. I just haven't found any surveys of national uh, media organizations asking reporters about status bias. So I had to go with the ones I had. Uh, the, um, I, I've often thought of it as a sort of an authority or power bias, which is a little different from status, but, but, uh, but along the same lines. Because if you're a Washington reporter, um, and you've been there for decades, and all your sources are in DC, and you really know well that under Secretary of Commerce, and he's going to leak you all the good uh, documents, or maybe you go out to lunch with the deputy director of the FBI, and your kids are in the same school, and your bias is not really uh, status as much it is, as it is sort of like pro-DC in an amorphous way. Um, because I mean, the, more, the more influence Washington, D.C. has over Americans, over the American economy, the more influence you have uh, the, um, uh, because of your sources, the more, influence, uh, the more money you're likely to get uh, if, um, because you, 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 um, uh, so, you know, for uh, viewership, um, readership, all of the, the obvious things. So that, that, that's your bias. It's, it's pro-D.C. It's not um, uh, it's pro your, the organization or agency you cover. It's pro DOJ it's, uh, or something as, a, um, as opposed to pro status. But maybe it's, it's, it's a close cousin of what you're saying. Uh, uh, yes? Yeah, so you mentioned like the, the um, you know, some, some other fields like uh, promotion and whatever are paid much higher. So does that mean that, um, but basically, the journalists we have are, uh, you know, like the bottom half of the class sort of thing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, no, no, it's a fair question. Well, I mean, you know, if you, if you can, you know, people have said this about the financial industry, right? You know, like, like, you know, if you're a real hot, M, you know, MBA, well, you're going to go and work for Goldman Sachs and earn 50 million instead of working for the SEC for, you know, 100,000 or whatever. You know what I'm saying? I think that's so, true. I mean, is there something? 
Uh, there's, I, I think it's, I think it's true, um, except with, with, the, with the exception of that, if you go to work for um, for the SEC, um, well, let's assume you're not in the, t in the top two percent, but you're like in the top twenty percent, uh, and then you can go uh, to uh, work for the FCC or the SEC or the FTC or a lot of other uh, three-letter uh, civilian regulatory agencies in DC, and you're going to make like 120k a year as deputy director of some bureau. But then once you're out, you're going to be um, bringing in over. Uh, a million a year as a, as a partner at a law firm. Um, uh, the head of the a Federal Trade Commission uh, recently said he, w he was leaving. His kids go into college this fall, uh, and he, he's. I, I talked to some some law firm partners uh, um, that of, of the firms that might hire him, and they're actually predicting he'll be making more like two to three million a year, which is you know not that bad uh, for someone who uh, is 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 not maybe the top of his class. So so it's the revolving door effect. Every time you go through the revolving door into an agency, you can increase uh, your billable hours. Maybe it's going up from five hundred to 700 uh, or, or more. So that, that there's there's that effect. But uh, it, to, to try to... If you, have a pub, if you can make, say, 100,000 as a publicist, right? yes. and, and you know, you're going to go and work for AP as just a dog writer journalist, you know, I mean, and you only get paid, what, 40,000? Uh, yeah, 44,000. So, I mean, what does that say about the quality of the, of the guy who's going to settle for 40,000 as opposed to somebody who's going to go out and get a hundred? It depends on how strong uh, the uh, this, this independent this indif Independence. I, I want to be independent. I want to write what I think. Or advocacy effect is. I mean, if, if um, uh, my theory is that it's strong enough to sometimes overcome for um, uh, that uh, lack of compensation, and you might be kind of proud of it. I'm just this gritty journalist, and I'm uh, going to be going out for cheap beers, and it's it's okay uh, that, that I'm making half half as much. But in some cases, it's also because journalists couldn't get the jobs. I mean, a lot of them a lot of them are English majors uh, uh, who, who aren't um, who didn't haven't studied technical disciplines, and so they can't get the better paying technical jobs. And especially in more New York and sometimes Silicon Valley, you have the case of these journalists making, in the average, 44K more in, in the major cities, are, are writing about the billionaires. And so then there's a, this, a little bit of class envy that, that can creep in. Uh, uh, yes, in the back. Uh, back to the, the um, authority bias and, and state bias. Uh, there's also a lot of people who said for establishment bias, that the people who are It's true. You, you have a job. You like the job. You like the people you work with. They largely agree with you. Uh, you don't want things to change. Uh, and uh, this is, and you can actually look at newspaper uh, c coverage of, say, Craigslist, and it hasn't always been, a, um, uh, and there's been some uh, really, really nasty CNN coverage of, uh, of, of Craig Newmark personally. I mean, it hasn't always been the type of coverage you might expect because, you know, it's, it's, it's in some ways a direct competitor in a, in because they're giving away classified ads for free or classified ad space for free. Uh, we have kind of time, I think, for a few more questions. In the back in the green, please. You talk about the, the effect that journalists have on uh, people and their, their influence. What are your uh, thoughts and the effects of, as far as media and like TV shows and popular media and stuff like that? What has it been an effect? Journalists think um, seeing or the TV show that people watch and what kind of energy that the people on that show? Um, for example, yeah, I'm watching a uh, new show with Tim Allen. There's a lot of like anti. He's um, anti of uh, his son-in-law or whatever is a quote-unquote hippie, and he's always coming over at her and stuff like that. So... It's, it sounds like Archie Bunker in the yeah, 70s. So I'm kind of thinking, like, what is this about the bigger effect in your opinion? The, the watching CNN and hearing their opinions, or watching a, a show you find funny and enjoyable, and, you know, that effect on you. I don't know. I haven't. I haven't given that any any thought. I'm not much of a pop uh, culture critic. I've never even heard of the, the show you mentioned. I apologize. Uh, I, I I view that um, TV shows as more of a lagging indicator of popular culture. Uh, maybe with a few exceptions like Will and Grace, but more than a, a leading indicator. Uh, I, I think that um, it, um, I, I'll t I still think that news might be a bit more important, um, uh, es especially because it's going to frame issues that, like foreign policy, that aren't probably going to come up in um, pop culture shows. I mean, maybe. I agree with that. I think that people here are more affected by stuff like that, but the popular, the general population, I wonder if they take more stake in what they see on popular television than what they see on news television. 
Uh, that might uh, well be correct, but I, but I mean, Hollywood is going to have its own bias, and that's a topic for a, a different um, a, a different time. But I think that, that in general, you're going to try to stay away from really hot button issues like is, uh, is gun control um, or, fi or restrictions of your Second Amendment rights going to be the front and center on a on a show? Probably not as as much as uh, you know as um, who's sleeping with whom. Uh, but I, you might well be right. I just don't know. Uh, let's, let's take one or two more questions. Uh, yes. Journalism schools, they are they're notoriously kind of being left wing. Um, is, is that because the, the students coming in tend to have a lefty kind of bent, or is it because they turn them into lefties you know, at the schools? You know what I'm saying? I, I've I've taught a graduate journalism class at American University in Washington D.C. as a lecturer, not as a not not as a full time uh, faculty member, and th I think that was an exception. So I shouldn't um, because a lot of the students were um, just wanted to you know they work in D.C. and they want a master's degree uh, because they uh, can get a pay increase in some government bureaucracy. But I think that that's probably an exception in general. Um, if uh, it, may, maybe the supply explanation works, I mean if you're um, you're already kind of predisposed. Uh, to go into journalism, if you want, view it as, as uh, some sort of a way for you to continue um, or uh, start in, in a career in advocacy, uh, so then that that would jibe with your with with your view that uh, journalism schools are biased in one way or another. So I, I, I wouldn't ar argue with that. I just don't have having a whole lot of data. Yeah, I. Uh, um, uh, 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 prob probably right. I mean, they, they li like maybe the, the broader mainstream media ecosystem. They'll probably they'd like to say that they're not, but they're going to have a, s a certain point of view. Uh, I, I think. Um, any, any other questions? Otherwise, we can call it uh, quits. Uh, th uh, thank you, folks, for coming. I um, appreciate your time. Thank you.